Lou Berger from San Diego. Yeah, took, took the train from San Diego uh, San to uh, New Orleans for this, particularly for this uh, uh, event, right? Right. So, uh, Lou, how come? How many times have you been here before? Well, I've been in New Orleans quite a few times for business. This is the first time I've been in New Orleans for the World War II Museum celebration. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about the museum, and I. Uh, also subscribed to the uh, World War II magazine, and they had a big uh, advertisement about the conference, and I said, uh, that looked pretty good to me, and I have the time to do it. I'm retired, and I, think, and I thought maybe I'd see some of my old buddies. So here I am. So where did you uh, serve? I was with the 1st Cavalry Division, in South Pacific. I was in 1943 to 46. South Pacific. I was there. Well, first island I was in was the Admiralty Island, which was Manus Island, which was for the, for the CB. Then I went to Hollandia, New Guinea. Then from there I went to Bayak, which was the northern part of New Guinea, another island. Then when MacArthur wanted to get a foothold in the Philippines, we went to Leyte in October 1944. And then in January 9, 1945, we went up to Luzon. We landed in the Guyan Gulf. And we, went, we worked our way down to Manila. We were young, you know, and we took our stride. A lot, of, a lot of boys were, of course, a lot of kids didn't come back, but the, the Japanese did a terrible thing in, in Manila when they, when they knew that, 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 that they were going to lose the island. They started to kill the Philippines, and they, started, and they were scheduled to kill the, the, Caucasian, Philipp, uh, the Caucasian prisoners. And when, I, when we got into Manila, when I say we, the whole outfit, these poor people were skin and bone. The little kids were all skin and bone. I don't know, the Japanese were none of very strong in Manila. Very strong. We, in fact, that's the first time that we were uh, had the experience of, right, uh, of fighting in buildings. Before you, we were in the jungle or out in the field. We were able to dig in and if I call at night and get some protection. But in the city, when you try to get some sleep, you, you slipped in the street. Because you can't dig in on concrete. <laughs> There's certain areas that, that uh, stick in my mind mostly. There was a stadium called the Rizal Memorial Stadium, which uh, was very well known throughout the city of Manila for all the sports events baseball, football, uh, whatever. And the Japanese were dug in there pretty good. And they were in the uh, grandstands and in the locker rooms and. Uh, and, uh, and uh, General Mudge, who was our general at the time, uh, he, uh, he ordered the tanks to bust a hole in the wall, let the tanks go through, the, because we were in an open field, so we had some, uh, some kind of cover from the, uh, from the uh, 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 snipers and so forth. Yeah, because a minefield, a couple of our guys got killed stepping on the mine. And then uh, the Japanese were, uh, when we chased them out of the old stadium, and right behind that was the uh, was the Pasig River, and they were hiding in the boats, and they were, they were all over the place. In fact, it was the Japanese Imperial Marines they had there. Yamashita was a Japanese general, and MacArthur sent him, because I don't know the full details, but he, he sent a, a General Yamashita a, a, a communique trying to keep Manila an open city, not to destroy it. And But um, Yamashita was going to go for it, but but one of his generals didn't want to do that. They started to destroy and burn the city. And that's when MacArthur ordered the artillery to go ahead and do their thing. And they destroyed the city, the beautiful city. Our job was to clear, not only the 1st Cavalry, we had 11th Airborne, we had a 43rd Division, which gives me my story right there. And so um, there was uh, you know, thousands of guys and. They all did their thing, and eventually the, the city was declared uh, liberated. Now, getting back to that, when we finally finished uh, our, uh, our job there, we got a rest camp. Sometimes they have to rotate the troops, get a shower, or clean up and get some hot food. And uh, I'm a musician, and I was young, and so I'm taking a little walk around, and I hear this music playing. And I see a band is playing, and so I, I go up to the bandstand, and I see they have a drum set back there, but no drummer. So I asked the leader of the band, what happened to your drummer? He said, well, he got killed. I said, well, I'm a drummer. If you need a drummer, I'll play. He said, well, go up there and play. So I did that, and, uh, and I'm, a, I'm a pretty good drummer. So he asked me if I'd like to join the 43rd Division band. 
I said, well, I'm in the first cavalry here. I don't know how it works. He said, well, give me your serial number and your outfit, and I'll send a letter to the, your commanding officer and see if we get you transferred. And he sent the letter. I got a copy of the letter. I, I found it. But the commander said, no, we can't transfer you here. I was essential. <laughs> you can look at all the pictures you want, and you can look at all of the, all of the demographics that you want, but the one thing you'll never be able to capture is the smell and the stink of 100,000 dead Filipinos in 115 degree heat and shade. With the maggots crawling in and out, that you'll never be able to, unless you were there, you'll never be able to explain that. No way in a million years. And that's something you'll never forget. Our biggest problem was water. We never get enough water. We have to get the Philippine girls to come to our foxhole and take our canteens and find water. I mean, it's 115 degrees. You got your all this equipment that you're carrying. You're sweating. And of course, not only did we have to fight the Japanese, but you had, you had cholera, malaria, tetanus, jungle rot. You had all kinds of things that uh, that were against you. And because we were, you know, I, I was I was a young kid in a middle class family in Philadelphia. What do I know about a gun? But, but, but they trained you, and you were, you were gung-ho, and you had, you had a job to do, and you had buddies, and you followed your, you followed your orders. I was trained well, but most of the kids got seasick, especially when you're the last one on the, uh, on the Higgins boat, because they'll circle around until all, all, all the guys get loaded. Then they straighten out and they all go in, in together. But you can be out there for an hour rock and rolling out there and they were throwing up in their helmets and, you know, but that's it. it's natural. Yeah. The, 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 while we were landing, there's mortars flying around, there's artillery coming from the, uh, from the beach. Another thing that the, our guys learned when they, uh, they, they would find these pill boxes that the Japanese would uh, hide in, waiting for us to hit the beach. And at, at the beginning, there was a lot of casualties, but then they got smart and they brought in a bulldozer off the LCI or LCT, whatever, and the bulldozer would drop the, his blade and just cover up all the pill boxes and bury them there. I think they're still there buried. Yeah. <laughs> That's just another technique. There's all kinds of things you learn from experience, you know, whatever, but uh, you see, listen, you're, you're, you're frightened and you're scared, but you, you say, it ain't gonna happen to me. And, you know, it's gonna happen. Your buddy. It's gonna happen. That's why I got, after the war was over, I could have, I got assigned over. They asked me, I was a sergeant, they asked me to sign over. I said, no, I said, the buddy system's gone. Everybody was going home. The logistics that they were handling was fantastic. How they got all these men home was unbelievable. Did any of your uh, buddies get killed? Quite a few. That's why I felt bad that at that dinner last night, they should have taken one minute of silence, or maybe even two minutes of silence, for all those great young kids that didn't come home. They're the ones that brought us here. They're the, they're the ones that made us sit here right here today.